I encourage you to do so. Uh, at our website, uh, visit us. We work it all the time. And thank you for appreciating this opportunity for us to showcase the talent of our men. But today, uh, this organization is deeply, deeply honored to be able to help present the Rick of Reese Taylor film. It's been a joy to spend some time with a family that made the trip from Alabama to join us to authenticate this experience. If you came here, you saw an exhibit out there talking about their work, their family had a treasure But we know that we have an extended family beyond simply the men who call themselves your gentlemen. It's our kinship network. It's a network of mothers, of grandmothers, of aunties and partners and wives that refer men to our program. We thank all of the women in our lives. We know that we could not work to transform our men's lives, and we could not do it without you. I also want to recognize that it's Women's History Month, and I trust that we all can recall the strong black women who were courageous trailblazers of the Civil Rights Movement. Call out the names Rosa Parks, Fannie Lee King, Fannie Lou Hood King, Greta Scott King, our own local Josie Johnson, and call out the name of Reese Taylor. Women who lived in our community and dedicated their lives to the fight for social justice and human rights for all. I'm going to ask to say a few thank yous here before we get too far into this. A few folks we have to thank who made today's program possible. First off, I want to thank my alma mater, University of St. Thomas, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion under the leadership of Dr. Artika Tyner and her staff. How many of you were moved by the, the movie? I don't know about you. But a touching story of courage, of fierce determination, and tenacity. So I want to start by thanking. We have a few special guests. We have on my far left, Mr. Henry Murray. We want to thank him. We have the family of Reese Taylor here. We also have Miss Asia Walker, just right next to Monique Linders. We have here, her here as well, the great-granddaughter of Mrs. Reese Taylor. Let's give her a round of applause. And Miss Mary, Miss Mary Joyce Owens, next to me. My rock, I got lucky. I got a chance to spend some time with Miss Mary. Can we also give her a round of applause? We know that they traveled a great distance to be with us today to honor the legacy of Reese Taylor. But I'd like to start by introducing our panelists. So I'll start again from the left. We have Ms. Monique Linder of OMG <laughs> Media with us. We also have, next to Asia Walker, we have CJ. We have a columnist from the Star Tribune and Fox 9 contributor and overall advocate. So we have CJ along with us as well, behind the camera. Next up, we have Bacola Ariola. She serves on the U.S. Commission and Council of Human Trafficking. Can we also welcome her? <laughs> to my immediate right, we have Beth Hawkins, an education journalist. So thank you and welcome. <laughs> and last but not least, we have one of our community sheroes here. We have Professor Nakima Levy-Pound. So can we give her a round of applause? So we want to jump right in, because I don't know about you, it left a lot of questions that we were looking for answers for and exploration. So I want to start with Monique Linder,
Because I remember in October, she said, there's this trailer you have to watch. Have you heard of Reese Taylor? It's like, no, I have not. And the humility in me said, I need to learn more. So she sent me on a journey of exploration. But I want to ask Miss Monique, how did you learn about Reese Taylor? How did you get involved with the film? And what, what really motivated you? Uh, last year, um, while the film was in its editing stages, I was asked by the producer to pre-screen the film in Montgomery, Alabama. And I named the day the spirit of Rosa Parks Day because Rosa Parks was, a, a, to me, a significant person in the film. And I saw this sisterly bond between Reese Park, uh, Reese Taylor and Rosa Parks. And during the film, which I did not know about the story at the time, and it really, um, it hurt me to watch this film and to hear the audience talk about it. But the picture that really ripped my heart was the news headline where Reese Taylor's husband was offered $600 to keep his wife silent. And... I often thought about what happened to the little girl sitting on her lap in that picture. And I, I figured there must be a family that can tell me more about Reese Taylor that I didn't see in the film. So I traveled to Abbeville and that's where I met the, her family. And actually CJ and I traveled there. And we learned so much about Reese Taylor, the person. And what you didn't see in the film was Reese Taylor forgave these men. She turned it over to God, and she never had any bitter feelings. And the film talks about this hard life that she had, but she really wasn't that person. She was so much full of life and love and her family and church, and she just was a, a very happy person. So um, it really touched me, and I wanted the world to know this tremendous family behind the person. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to turn to the panelists. I'll start with turning to CJ. You said CJ traveled with you. CJ, tell me the emotions. Tell me what you felt. Tell me what motivated you. The first thing is that I want to give uh, lead another round of applause for Monique because she has been my constant companion for about two months now. And she has poured her, she has worked her butt off for this event. She has been working like tirelessly, I know, for the last couple of months. Uh, the uh, trip to Abbeville was uh, very, very disturbing. And this documentary is very disturbing. I also didn't know anything about this part of the South, just something else about to be about which to be embarrassed regarding the Deep South. Um, the part that had the greatest impact on me was the uh, the number of steps from the church that she that she left that night in 1944. The distance between that church and where she is now laid to rest. I wish I had marked those off, but it can't be more than three blocks. And she's buried in her church cemetery. So her, that she was visiting a different church the night that she was abducted. So whenever she went to her home church, she had to be on the street where this horrible thing began for her. And that just bothers me to, to no end, and it's just, um, you know, she can forgive these people, but, you know, I, I'm not of my, that forgiving, so. <laughs> the, but, uh, but she, but it was, uh, we had a great trip down there, and, well, it, it was also interesting that despite uh, the modern day we live in, and how good the roads are now, and how uh, easy it is to get down there, there was, there's still a, a darkness. I mean, this it's not, you know, four-lane highway and interstate. And I think about how scary it must have been for Rosa Park, and it was reinforced by what I saw today. Because this, this is a time when you were in the Deep South when you couldn't pass white people on the highway, that you weren't allowed to, you know, go around them, you weren't allowed to follow their cars too closely. 
and how terrifying that trip must have been for her to go down there and know that you're going to be confronted by this fool who is the sheriff and one of the many fools down there. And Rosa Park was just made of steel is what this story tells me. Because she was, I mean, she went back. <laughs> and, right. And, and, and uh, it, it's, uh, this, this, is, this has been the most uh, upsetting piece of history that I've learned in a long time. And I just, I just didn't know what was going on. Thank you, CJ. I'm going to turn down to the end, to you, Professor Levy Pounds. We need some help here. Because what I'm starting to notice, we have a little amnesia around history. Can you set the context of this? Because one of the things I saw Fannie Lou Hamer in the film, she said a black woman's body was never hers alone. What do we need to know about the intersection between race and gender? Well, I would say that what happened to Reese Taylor is emblematic of what's been happening to black women throughout history from the point of time in which our ancestors were brought here against their will where they were forced to labor from before sun up to after sundown, and where they faced um, inhumane conditions and extreme brutality, including um, the separation of black children and families. And during the days of slavery, black women in particular did not have control over their own bodies. At any point in time, um, a slave master could rape a black woman um, he could impregnate a black woman. He could also force her to breed with any man on the plantation. And um, when black women were pregnant, one of the most horrific things that would happen was that they would still be subjected to physical assault and brutality. And so there are stories um, that talk about slave masters um, and overseers digging uh, holes in the ground for the uh, belly of the pregnant black woman to lie into. And um, the hole was to protect uh, her child while she was being beaten. And it had nothing to do with um, the safety of the woman. It had everything to do with that child being property and wanting to make sure that that child um, came out alive. And so think about black women who, uh, after giving birth under those horrific conditions, would be forced back out um, into the field to work. Someone else might be responsible for their child until they got to an age in which the child could go out um, and labor in the fields as well. And black women weren't allowed to marry during that particular time. And so if they found a life partner, not only could they not marry that person, but they could be forced to um, breed with someone else um, during the days of slavery. And so think about the fact that what happened to Reese Taylor is not that far removed from slavery. We're not that far removed from slavery in terms of the things that our people continue to experience and that black women in particular um, continue to experience. Things like um, our stories not being believed. Um, at times, we don't feel that we have control over our own person or our own body because a lot of the laws and the policies that are in place. And um, even when we do have control over our physical bodies, what happens when we go into the workplace and we're dehumanized or we're treated like we're inferior? Uh, we're not believed when we tell stories of discrimination. All of those things cumulative, cumulatively and collectively impact the black woman's psyche and physical, mental, and emotional health. And these are issues and impacts that we continue to suffer from to this day. But women like Rosa Parks and Reese Taylor give me hope because in spite of all of the inhumanity, the brutality, the degradation, the humiliation that they endured, they continue to stand up and fight and to speak their truths. So I think that that's a powerful lesson for us to learn um, of the black women's strength and power in the midst of oppression. And the last thing that I'll add is even with all of the things that black women have endured, we're still expected to take care of our families and our communities. 
but who's taking care of black women? Thank you. So now I'm gonna turn to two folks on the panel, to CJ and also to Beth. I'm gonna turn to the role of the media. Because one of the things that Rosa Parks did very effectively was engage the media. The Chicago Defender, in fact, said that this was one of the strongest campaigns for equal justice in that decade. So the power of the media in shaping stories and shaping minds and having an impact. So Beth, would you like to get us started? So what I perceive most often and have perceived throughout my career is the power of the media to lock certain voices out to shape the narrative by deciding who gets to speak to it and whose voices are included in it. Um, and I was thinking this morning, actually, about Dr. Levy Pounds and um, what happened when the mayoral endorsements came down in Minneapolis. So we've experienced in this community two or three years of very intense discussion about race and community protests and police brutality. And it was a frustration of mine that I've written about several times that in every single one of those stories, the reporters went to the head of the police union in Minneapolis, Bob Kroll. And it took the better part of a year, year and a half maybe, for any mainstream voice to point out that this man had a very troubled history and a history of ties to white supremacy. And in the story where they did that, they quoted an officer by the name of Soro, who has, a, who has cost the city millions and millions of dollars in brutality claims. That was the source they turned to to legitimize the police union chief who was always, always, I mean, above and beyond the, the, our female police chief, who was not a very effective voice, in my opinion. He was the person that they turned to first. When the mayoral endorsements came down, the newspaper said that they appreciated Dr. Levy Pound's position in the community, and they thought that she ought to lend her voice to that discussion, to the discussion about Black Lives Matter, black rights, and police brutality. Is it like lost on anybody here, the irony that not once did they consult that voice? That she wasn't called on? That no one um, sought to make that part of the dominant narrative? And it's not one newspaper. I don't mean to single out one newspaper. St. Paul um, had a very ugly narrative going for quite some time about uh, demands that supposedly Black Lives Matter was making on the school district, um, which is my beat. And I remember in particular a story where a number of families um, were protesting essentially the abuse of a boy who I think was 11 or 12, I don't remember. Um, his bus driver, he'd videotaped on his phone his bus driver uh, essentially giving him a very hard time for having joined some of the community protests. And there was a school board meeting where the board stopped mid-action, just like shut off the lights and stopped the discussion. And the, the story the next morning in the St. Paul Pioneer Press was Black Lives Matter shuts down the school board. There was no discussion of the um, white people who had shown up to defend a teacher who had published um, racially inflammatory fantasy stories about his students which was the heart of the protest. Um, there was no mention of the fact that there was an 11 or 12 year old boy at the heart of the discussion. And you know, I wrote a blog post that said the other descriptor of these women is parents. But no, you know, it had to be framed as a community um, protest. And I, you know, I raise all this because the, the point that I wanna make is that the news media um, is no, more interested in general, in, in my experience, in undoing the dominant narrative than any of our other institutions. And if you push on that from within, it's pretty easy to get labeled you know, a gadfly, um, somebody who won't give up that story, like why are you trying to tell that story over again? We already told that once. Um, there are justifications. I mean, I'm sure the justification for quoting Bob Kroll in all of those stories was continued access. I'm positive of that, because I was trained on that in journalism school. You don't lose access to the people who control the flow of news. Um, so I am not surprised that we're sitting here in this auditorium learning about Recy Taylor via alternative sources of information. I'm not surprised that 
this story was told by going outside the record that the media created. Um, and it's encouraging to me in 2018 to see increasingly people in the community doing that for themselves. We've had a couple of elections in the Twin Cities where candidates have just bypassed official sources of sanction. Um, Dr. Levy Pounds ran a very strong campaign with, I think, like no money, um, based, I believe, on the authenticity of her voice and without the endorsement and co-signing of the official media. Um, so I think it's gonna take a long time. I'm discouraged that I'm 35 years in to my time with the news media and that we haven't come further, but I am encouraged that we're here today. I'll turn down to CJ and I'll, I'll add a little extra to the question because I talked about initially the question was related to the role of media, but here's a bit of the challenge. A lot of students that I talk to, community members are like, but it's a post-racial society. We have nothing to worry about. These issues of race, they don't matter anymore. We're all equal. The millennials don't see race. You see where I'm going with this, right, CJ? What, what do we have to think about in the context of, I talked about it as amnesia of our history, but active denial. How, how do we think about this in the, the age of, of media and social media? I don't even know where to begin with that. Mm -hmm. um, see, um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, I see you with your camera and your recording, read your articles. What can media do? Maybe I'll, I'll frame the question that way versus looking at the opposite of what media may not be doing. Let's look at what can media do. Well, the media's not perfect. <laughs> Nothing is, nor are we, but let's, let's see what we can do. <laughs> um, we should probably be more open to people suggesting the directions for us than we are. Um, I know that now that people post things on Facebook and other platforms like that, that we do pay a lot of attention when we see something kind of interesting. So members of the public have, uh, do, do get our eye and ear when, when that happens. Um, the main job of the media is to tell accurate stories. And so, and we need help with that. And we need people to tell us everything that they know about a situation and even to share the information that, that they think may not be helpful to what they would like conveyed in the newspaper because we want to present the whole picture. And I'm, I'm not going to defend um, the media. Uh, I just had an interview with um, uh, William Roden, uh, longtime sports columnist for the New York Times, and now he works at ESPN on its uh, the undefeated.com. Uh, and I was asking him why when I see all these stories about something that Trump has done and all these and all this investigation going on, and they'll be on you know Rachel Maddow's show and Lawrence O'Donnell. None of these people who are reporting these great investigative stories are people of color. I haven't seen anybody who, was a, who looked like a person of color. I mean, not a hint of color. And he told me that the, you know, the news media is one of the most racist organizations there is because, because we, we don't have enough, you know, we've got our own work to do. And you can have a few sprinkled in every now and then, but that's still, you know, it, it's a bigger problem than that. I remember uh, a long time ago, uh, when I was working in, in Michigan, there was uh, some upheaval in Flint, and this kind of riot had developed, and there weren't many black people there. Well, did I have any of the black reporters there? There had to be somebody, I'm, I'm probably forgetting. And I remember one of my, uh, one of my uh, co-workers came back from covering this and he said, you know, we need to do better with our numbers of people of color. And this is a long time ago. And he said, he says, because today when I was out there covering that riot, he said, I wish there'd been one more black reporter 
at the Flint Journal, and I wish it had been me. So what you're hearing that it must have been even more of a challenge in 1944, thinking about who had access to the media, who was there. But despite that, the beauty of our people, the beauty of black people is that they created their own narrative. The Chicago Defender, you have Robert Abbott with just a quarter deciding that he was gonna use that quarter to invest in creating his own media outlet. But a larger question is how do we use our voices? So with that, I'm gonna to turn to Bukola Ariola. I'm gonna ask you a bit, I know you have background as a journalist from Nigeria, but in present day times, I know that you're focusing on advocacy. And how do you turn a story from being a victim story to the story of a victor? Tell me about the power of a story and tell me about how we can leverage that story to bring forth change in our communities. Thank you, Dr. Tyner. Um, I would start with the media because uh, that is where I came from. And I think my background in media gave me the basics to use when I became a victim and got help. And it let me see the power of using your story. Mind you, it's also giving your life down. It's important to know that when you put your face to a story, you should be prepared to just be dead. Be dead to negative comments. Be dead to comments that triggers trauma again and again for you. And um, try to focus on some of those strengths from you know, your roots or your background. Because for me, the, the strength I focused on was in my tribe, they say when you go to the market, because it's not like going to cup food, it's going to open market where there is a lot of noise. You pay attention to the person you are transacting with and ignore the noise of the market. So turning to advocacy, the person I'm transacting with is the victim and talking to the victim through my story and ignoring all the noises of the lashback, of comments from a family member, a friend, that is not so um, good at the moment. I really commend the family of Resi Taylor for staying with her. I'm not surprised the husband you know, didn't stay so long because that is what usually happens. Everybody stays away from you. And unfortunately, the closest person to you that you are holding on to for the strength will leave you when you do not expect it. And the way to kind of get the strength is to continue to hold on to whoever is willing to hold on to you at that moment. So I use all of those as the strength to share my story and just be deaf to the negative comments, including some of my own colleagues. In fact, I just got an interview question from a fellow colleague, and I read those questions, and I was like, really? And I responded accordingly. Then she came back, oh, you know, you didn't answer all the questions. You were just giving me one-liners. Go and use the one-liner. <laughs> if you are an effective journalist and know what you are doing, you can use those one-liners to write the story. And that is also where the media comes in. How do we report the story? If I didn't go through what I went through, trust me, I will be one of those bad journalists also who does not pay attention to trauma or even really understand what the victim is going through and how it affects the whole community. So it's very important uh, as we are advocating for the media to join the advocacy and learn from victim stories. Not just hearing the victim stories to get uh, a great headline, but to heal our community and stop the injustice against people in the community. There are so many people and trust me, even in this room today that we are in, I'm sure there are victims in this room who have never shared their story once. 
And the reason they have not shared their story is because they are afraid to say it to the next person. Because when I say it to you, you, the way you're going to be looking at me is going to be different from the way you've been looking at me. Perhaps I have this status and I just want to keep it that way. And once you know, the way you will be looking at me will change. And that will make me even sometimes when your action is something completely different, I will be misinterpreting your actions. So uh, it's very important to share the story. But as we are sharing the story also, to be mindful of the trauma the person has gone through. And not only that person's trauma, but the secondary trauma, you know, it's like you, you drop a stone in the water and it splashes all over the place. The family members, the close people, their children. Today we have uh, racist children in the room or grandchildren in the room. You know, how it affects all those people is very important with the way we advocate. I hope our audience members will start getting ready for your questions as well, because we want to hear from you also. But I'm going to ask a question of everyone here on the stage with me, because we're watching a, a film related to Reese Taylor of 1944, fast forward to 2018. If we had opportunity to write the next article, to write the next chapter of the history book, what lessons does the next generation need to know about Reese Taylor? And I'll open up to whoever would like to get us started. What do they need to know? I think Miss Mary, she was ready. <laughs> no, I would speak. I would say that um, she was a woman that loved God and her family, and that she was an honest woman. You know, uh, like you said earlier, none of us are perfect, but she was wholesome and God-fearing and just a loving person. And what she wanted most of all is for them and everyone else to know that she was not a liar, you know that she stood for truth. And even though she told him that she wasn't gonna say anything, and she told every, she said when she got to someone, she told everybody she saw, because she was terrified, you know, and that was a traumatic incident to happen to anyone, you know. And most of all, to know that she was honest and true, you know. Thank you. I can go. Well, my take on that is, um, with Aunt Reese, she was um, a woman of courage. She refused not to tell her story. She wanted to tell the truth, and she wanted to be believed in telling the truth. Uh, she had the opportunity to speak to some young children at a black history program, and that was one of the things that she told them, to always be honest, always tell the truth, always believe in the Lord, and always do what your parents say do. She believed that she lived a long life because she did what her mother told her to do, and she tried to do everything right. She was full of love, she was full of faith, she was full of courage, and most of all, she had strength. Um, I gained strength from her song, Walk With Me. As most of us know uh, in the lyrics of that song, it says, a tedious journey. Aunt Reese taught me that a tedious journey was, I'm catching hell in life with no destination. But if I'm on a pilgrim journey, I'm catching hell in life, but it's Jesus as my savior, I'm bound for heaven. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I miss my grandma so much. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard for me to speak about it, but um, that was my first time actually seeing the documentary full. So it was um, very hard, especially seeing the parts and hearing her talk. But um, if if I was to write something um, for kids to see and my kids to see and know, um, it would be that, you know, all the faith my grandmother had and all the courage and the way she spoke up but still to this day, and we're in 2018, and she still didn't receive the justice that she should have received, we might as well still be in 1944. But don't be afraid to speak up, and don't be afraid to tell your truth because the time is up. 
and there will be no more Risa Taylors as long as we keep fighting and, you know, living through her legacy and, and speaking about it. So that's what I would want the kids to know. And the one thing that I would want young people to know is, and with all of us sitting here, is that with each generation, we do have to teach them to be like Reese Taylor and Rosa Park, to have that courage to go out, to continue fighting, because it's a continuous fight. It's not going to end. So, you know, fighting for human rights and fighting against injustice is an ongoing battle that we will all have to continue to teach each generation that comes along. Well, it, um, we can all exhale because this what Reese Taylor went through would never happen in this day and time. I mean, we are, the the challenges are always where the, her story, where no one would touch her story. That wouldn't happen, I don't think. For some, however, someone thinks that would happen. No. Uh, however. This is where I dropped the mic. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. My, my own advice for the young folks is that you have the power in your hands now. Unlike the time when there was no social media, and even let's step aside a little bit from social media. Now you can have your own self-hosted domain website that you can use to speak out, that you can use to tell stories. You heard that um, she said that now we watch the social media for stories. Yes, the media are now watching, journalists are now looking for stories on social media. So the power is in your hands now to use the social media. And going beyond social media, use the website. Because for me too, as a victim of human trafficking and domestic violence in Minnesota. Because some people ask me questions like, how were you trafficked in your country? I was never trafficked in my country, but in the US, the land of the free. And even in this Minnesota, I had journalists who didn't want to write my story, who treated me in certain way when they asked the questions. And when the story came out in the news, my portion was cut off because that was not what they wanted. But guess what? Now I have over 10 websites to tell my story. Now I have different social media accounts to tell my story. When I was first appointed to the uh, US Advisory Council on Human Trafficking, one of the things they do is to vet you and ask for all your email addresses and your social media accounts and website. And when I was being interviewed, the interviewer said, wow, You've done so much because they dog. I'm always doing video online. I've done video this morning on Facebook. So please use what you have now. That is the advantage the young folks have. Now you can tell your story how you want it to be told. If someone is writing something else or they don't even want to write about you or they don't want to feature you, you write about yourself. You tell your story how you want it to be, and you own that story. Thank you. Oh, well. Thank you. Speak your truth, Miss Mary said. But most importantly, I hope one of the assignments that I'll give you is help to speak the truth about Miss Reese Taylor. You can't go home today and say, oh, that was an interesting program. You need to be able to tell your family, your friends, through social media, pick up the phone, however you do it, send a postcard because we don't want the story to be who is Reese Taylor. We want Reese Taylor's life to live and breathe within each of us as a sense of responsibility on what we can do, as Mr. Henry said, Miss Asia, that she didn't receive justice. We are the caretakers of justice. I know I'm not a panelist here, but as I read the names of the men, as I watched the documentary, yes, we can focus on them. That's important, don't get me wrong. But where were their wives? Where were their sisters? Where were their brothers? Where were their aunts? Where are their uncles? So history will ask us today, where are you? Where are those moments where you are silent and you are comfortable in the face of injustice? 
Where are you when you see that thing on social media and you just click right past it? I mean, my awakening, I will tell you, I was just like, I don't even understand social media. My students helped me. But when I saw Facebook Live with Philando Castile, I was like, what is that? I didn't even know what Facebook Live was. I can't tell you the nightmares that continued on with that, of seeing. Reading and seeing are two different things. And I remember on the first year anniversary of his death, I was mitigating a conflict for the university. And I got a call. And I said, OK, you know, tell me what's going on. She was like, what's wrong with you, sister? I was like, what's wrong with me? What did I miss? Sorry. She was like, how are you going to ask me how am I in this state of rage? How are you going to ask me how am I when justice hasn't been served for Philando? I had to pause and put the phone down. We cried together. And I want to salute. I know we have Philando Castile's mother. Do we still have her in the audience? I thought I saw her earlier. But she was here. But I want to make sure that I salute her as well. So I want to make sure that we're not just asking that question, how are you today? How are the Vikings? You know, how's the weather? But we ask that question of Harambe. It asks the question of how are the children? But I want us to go a step further. The Maasai warriors would go village to village, and they would not be satisfied until we say the children are well. And we have to say the children are not well in the face of injustice. Let me just let the mic go. Beth, please, please. <laughs> Not well, not well. Sure. Oh, well. Pass it off to me after that impassioned yeah. bit. No, I had to let it go. You got to purge <laughs> some of these pains. Uh, I grew up not far from here, um, walking distance from this room, and I was taught that Rosa Parks was a domestic, which just it kills me now when I think about it. Like, what is that even? Like, that's a cast. That's not even a person or an occupation. That's, that's a designation that tells you where she was on the social strata. And furthermore, she was a domestic whose feet hurt because she'd had a long day. And she sat down innocently. And that was the story that I grew up hearing. Um, and I think that when I think about that these decades later, that's the story that we told about her because we needed to minimize her. And I, by I say we, I'm pointing at myself. I'm pointing at you know, white people and later than in my life, the news media. We needed to make her less than. And we needed to strip her of her strength and her power and her resilience. Um, because that is dangerous uh, on multiple levels to people to think of her as a powerful and resilient woman um, with gifts that we need to receive. And now what I do for a living is to our schools, where children who are locked out of equity and opportunity are either doing spectacularly well or spectacularly poorly. And I will tell you um, that there's a growing body of research that's backed exactly what I've seen, which is that when children are told that story of resilience and power and brilliance, and that they come from a long, long legacy of that, there is no gap. There is There may be gaps of resources, there may be other kinds of gaps and hurdles to surmount. But you close that gap in that moment where you tell that nar narrative of resilience and strength. So I would say, if I'm using my full imagination in terms of what the next chapter would look like, I think that it would be a chapter in which white supremacy is once and for all dismantled in American society and across the world. Every single institution that we deal with, from law enforcement to uh, our, our court system, to the media, to the public education system, to the system of higher education, to the law school system, um, medical system, every single system, is built upon white supremacy. And we see the impacts of that on a regular basis. And part of the challenge comes in when we look at the story of Reese Taylor um, as a microcosm of what's happening without also connecting it to the macro level of what is happening, what types of societal and historical conditions allowed for that brutal attack against this black woman to take place. Right? What, what societal conditions? What, what were the conditions of the minds of the people who allowed this to take place? And what are our conditions today? So we can look at that horrific situation and think that it would never happen today. But most of the time we turn on the news and what do we see? 
someone being executed right in front of us. And we're being told to just wait for an investigation to happen. We're being told not to be angry, not to be upset, to trust the process. And time and time again, the process has failed us, right? But yet many people in our society and some in this audience still believe in the process, even though lives are being taken. And unless we begin to dissect what's happening through the lens of dismantling white supremacy, we'll continue looking at these issues in a piecemeal fashion. Even when we're talking about the public education system, one that was grounded in this notion of white supremacy. You go back to the days of slavery where it was illegal for black children to learn to read. And not only could they face criminal penalties, but they would actually have limbs severed or even be killed if black children tried to learn how to read, if black adults tried to learn how to read, if slave masters had pity upon their slaves and tried to teach them how to read, they would face the same fate. And so it's no coincidence when we look at today's public education system that our children are still being denied access to educational opportunity. And what are we doing? We're labeling it as an achievement gap, which is a false paradigm by which to view a system built upon white supremacy. We're placing the blame on the children and the parents, and we're not looking at the way in which the institution is structured. And, and it's an institution that's structured primarily to keep black adults out of the classrooms, right? And we're wondering why there's a problem with our children. We look at the textbooks, our history is not being told in those textbooks. History is being taught through a lens of revisionist history and white supremacy, so it's no wonder we hadn't heard her story. It's no wonder we didn't know the truth about Rosa Parks. It's no wonder that there are so many black women that these issues have happened to, as well as black men who have been oppressed. It's no wonder that these things are going on. So I cannot imagine the future um, the way that Dr. King talked about it unless we dismantle white supremacy. And that starts with all of us questioning the narratives, asking ourselves what's our role, and then taking the steps of changing the things that we do not like that are happening in society and taking personal responsibility. And the last thing that I will say is that white parents and grandparents in this audience must begin to take personal responsibility for what you are or are not teaching your children about people of color. Because if you fail to teach them specifically about the history, then you are perpetuating white supremacy because we live in a white supremacist society. And so to not teach them is to allow the rest of the system to teach them, which will lead to these types of incidences and ones in which black men, black women, black children are being killed by police by your children and grandchildren. It's unacceptable. So my hope is that, as Dr. Tyner said, we don't leave here just thinking we heard a good discussion, but we leave here armed and dangerous with the knowledge that it's time to take action. Thank you. you know I can't let you go with just that statement. Educate us. When you say white supremacy, give us a clear definition. Because I, I know my dad always said, call a spade a spade. Show me the spade. How do you define that, Professor? Break it down for us. I want people to go home and say, she wasn't talking to me. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> well, I wish that Professor Okadi was here. <laughs> I was looking, he was, too. He, he was here in the front row. He may have gone to the restroom, but he is um, an expert on this notion of white supremacy. He's written books um, about these issues. And the way that I look and think about white supremacy um, has to do with this notion of white superiority. Right, that is that message is reinforced time and time again. Whether you're watching the news, you're watching television shows, you're in school, whether it's K through 12 or higher education, just about everything that is taught um, is through the lens of white superiority, which means that every other racial category of individuals are inferior, right? And that is perpetuated throughout the different systems and the ways in which we're treated within these systems. And so by definition, any white person who is living in this country is going to have a white supremacist ideology. And most people shy away from that. They say, I'm not racist. I am a Democrat. I'm a DFL or I'm progressive. I'm liberal. I care about all people. Well, if you have not done extensive 
internal work to become anti-racist, by nature, you will be racist because that's the way that this society is structured and that's what we're asking people to fight against. It's not enough to not be racist. You have to make the intentional decision to be anti-racist. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So you called upon him and he's coming. Professor, Dr. Mahmoud El Khati, we need you to put some meat on our head today. We're talking about the topic of giving definition to white supremacy. Basically, we're asking the question, Professor, we're asking it today, what is the lesson that we need to take away from Reese Taylor's story? What do you hope for us to go home with? What's the message? We know you got a word for us today. Let us know. What do we need to know? Everything. Uh, everything, okay. <laughs> you know, that's, um, it's not as easy as it sounds. It's not as easy as Oh, thank you. The first part he said is not as easy as it sounds. So he's he's coinciding with Professor Levy Pounds. We got to put some work in, please. Absolutely, that's where everything comes from. But I want to say, hold on, Professor. Lord. We want to hear this. No, no, no. We want to we want to hear you. I want to say first and foremost, we're almost there. I think people are growing up. I think our people are uh, maturing politically. And it's around the understanding of this powerful myth that we call race. You know, it's a modern invention. It's not, it's an invention, not a discovery. People have looked these different ways for many, many, many years and many, many, many places. All classical civilizations, as far as I can tell, were multicultural and what some of us would call multiracial, all of the classical, even the Greeks, you know, uh, encounter this, but we must understand the doctrine of white supremacy, or you're not gonna understand anything else. If you don't understand the doctrine of white supremacy, you're gonna be confused about everything else in this society. That's the source of it all, is that doctrine, based on a myth called race, which has not been in our vocabularies no more than 300 to 400 years that people have even used the word race. Dr. Ashley Montague, who wrote the book that's, that teased my imagination, uh, called Man's Most Dangerous Myth, The Fallacy of Race. What's wrong with the fact of race is it goes beyond the fact. It has nothing to do with your skin color. It has to do with uh, individual ability, cultural achievement, being determined by the way you look. That's a myth. And a myth is not just some idle tale people tell. All myth is grounded in some reality, some fact. But that's what myth, um, historians, use myth all the time. That's what creates societies, movement sometimes, a myth, a little bit of fact, a lot of fabrication, a lot of fiction, and so forth. That's what, what race is. Uh, it can't be anything else that, I, that white people don't know, the ones I've encountered, that they are not, have not always been white. They don't know that. Yeah. White people don't know <laughs> that the <laughs> the Irish white people in America were enslaved to the British for 700 years. Any Irishman, well-informed Irishman knows that. What happened to race, the color? These are white folk, <laughs> but they are Irish. You know, and they use some physical fact to go beyond the fact. You know, Irish would call the Irish race. You know, too much red hair. <laughs> Too many freckles, <laughs> too many pug noses. You, take, you can take something physical. Women found that out later. When Simone de Beauvoir taught that one is not born a woman, but one becomes a woman. Something physical. Her vagina kept her from getting a job as a bus driver. <laughs> you understand? You know, you bus driver, is, it's, it has nothing to do with the sex. I remember the first woman bus driver I saw 
It was in New York City, and I was about 12 years old. And I was gawking at this woman because she was a bus driver. That's man, you know, women don't do that, right? I'm gawking at the woman, and she's gawking at me. <laughs> what are you looking at, fool? You know, kind of thing like that. I didn't, didn't know. <laughs> All that comes from Sigmund Freud. Yeah, the great psychiatrist, the great uh, guy who experimented a lot with coke. He did a lot of that, yeah. Oh, yeah, he, he <laughs> admitted it. But he says that uh, anatomy is destiny. That's, you, know, woman, you know what I'm talking about? The woman's anatomy, her vagina, determines what she can do in life. I mean, sex, your, your gender has nothing to do with driving a bus. But people set up social codes, rules, and so forth. And that's what makes race largely a social construct. We should not be confused about where we are now uh, with this question of race. When I say racism, when, I don't use that term anymore. I mean white supremacy, because that's what it is. <laughs> There's no counterpoint to that in this society. There's no Indian ideological racism. There's no black ideological racism. What you call black people are angry because they are oppressed. And that, that's just human. Anger is not hatred. <laughs> Martin Luther King tried to teach us that. So. No, I, when I call people racism, you're defending a system, a doctrine, set up by the founding fathers. That's, what, that's who there's, there's 55 men <laughs> wrote racism in the Constitution when black people were made property. It's three-fifths of other persons. And then there were all these laws of, about one, runaway slaves and hiring people to catch black people and so forth. It's a doctrine. Every institution in America is racist, more or less. There are no, there take about 10 institutions to run any society. And you start with the government. There was once 44 rationales taken out of the Bible to justify slavery. The last time I heard that rationale was from the governor of Mississippi. And I said, we're supposed to treat black people this way because they sinned against God. You know what I'm talking about? The curse of Ham. The curse of Cain. That's all this is a, it's an ideology like communism. The people in communist Russia from 1917 to 1990 lived under an ideology. And we, when we say ideology, we mean communism. Every country has an ideology. Every country has a model of itself. And that model of itself is false. We know different from anybody else. You know, I think the father's father, the founding father would disagree with many white people who have made them demigods. That bothered George Washington. He said, we know the Constitution isn't perfect, but we expect the generations after us will, will correct it. And that didn't happen. You know, uh, I'll stop and say this. Read notes on the state of Virginia. How many know that book? That's what I'm saying. I meet intellectuals who won't acknowledge that. The only book that Jefferson wrote under his name, 1781, called Notes on the State of Virginia, the contents of which is, you know, he was the all-purpose genius, so he, he, you know, the land, the lakes, he explains everything, and then he got to a chapter called Laws, dealing with black people and the native people of this country. He dismissed Native Americans as savages. <laughs> when you read that, you will see the same, it's the trope that, 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 that racists use today. All of them, some of them about the beauty of people, the white people are the most beautiful, uh, condemning black people because of their skin color and all stuff that we don't require much sleep and so forth. We look as brave as white people, but that's because we're not aware of danger. All of that. He said one thing that might make white people mad at a, a guy like me, but he could get away with it. 
black people. Have. I've never seen one who I think could, ha could master Euclidean theory or higher geometry. Never seen a black person, in spite of Benjamin Banneker, whom he knew. But he said one thing. Well, well, among other things, he thought he was a musician, a little half-baked fiddlist. <laughs> he said there's one thing. Musically, they are superior to us. <laughs> the perfect tone and pitch. <laughs> so that's a half-baked compliment. But he said, uh, yeah, I couldn't say that. Because I don't, I don't think black people are genetically gifted to be better than white people but they're more adventurous and they discover new things out of a background that whites don't have. Polyrhythm, the blue note, that comes from Africa. You know, these fundamental things which created American music is African. I call American music, individual American music, I mean original American music, black music. <laughs> That's what you can't call it that. But what else is? Ragtime, where did it come from? The spirituals, where did the jazz come from? Where did swing come from? Where did rock and roll come from? I was born three doors from, from, a, from a juke joint. I went to bed hearing that every night, rock and roll, before Elvis Presley showed up. If he lived, we'd have been about the same age. Most people don't know what that means when Bessie Smith says, I'm gonna rock my daddy with one steady roll. They don't, they don't know that's a euphemism for sex. <laughs> They don't know that crying. You understand what I'm saying? When Louis Jordan said, all she wants to do is rock. All she wants to do is rock. Rock and roll all night long. That's white people say we, we make them whoopy, you know, whatever. It's, it's euphemism. In our lifetime, we've seen black people shape popular culture, and nobody can call it that. The greatest genre right now is the thing that comes from South Bronx and parts of New York. It's called, you know, no, hip hop. That's a black creation. It's the, it's the culture of currency among youth all over the world. I was in France two years ago, and I took a ghetto out of the airport good. There they were, rappers in France. Hollywood from the children. They're just doing all, you know, it's all over the world. Okay. And we've got to say that. We, we have to have a courage enough to affirm black culture. Not, as in, not black, black in color, but it comes from this rich, intangible experience that we have. And somebody got to have the courage enough to stand up and take it from these people who are the critics of our music. It is, this music is so important to a people's life and a culture. It, it saved us. Music, music saved us, you know. The spirituals, the Negro spirituals, they're being sung right now somewhere in Poland. I have a friend, that, that's how he makes his living. He goes to Eastern Europe and they still sing the spirituals. And we have negated that because we were slaves. My answer to that is what Ralph Ellison taught me. I'm no longer ashamed that my ancestors were slaves. I'm only ashamed of having once been ashamed. I have, I have another uh, recommendation for reading, uh, and inspired by a phone call I got last year from a friend of mine who uh, lives in Minnesota and now lives down south. And she called me and wanted to know if she had ever done anything, she's a white woman, who has ever done anything to me that I considered racist or I was offended by uh, anything she said or so forth and so on. And I said, no, and she, said, she says, I didn't think so. She said, you're the kind of person you to call me on the spot. And so she said that the reason she was asking me this is because she, her church had just read a book Waking Up White People by Debbie Irving. And she said that, uh, that, that it just pointed out all the ways in which the society has been set up to help her and not help me. 
And so I haven't read the book yet, but but she was uh, but she calls me and she, <laughs> and shared that. Thank you. I think we started a book club here. But I want to make sure if you want to follow up related to Professor Okadi's work, please make sure you pick up a copy of The Myth of Race to unpack this thing that we take an ownership of, to just say this is the way things are. But race, the lesson that I learned from him is, and racism is power plus prejudice. So that means we have the human power and capacity to deconstruct it. Because the opposite of every evil, of every ill, is love. And I know we brought Dr. King into the atmosphere as well, of that beloved community. But he said justice is really love and calculation. Justice is really love and calculation. So he talked about this moral universe, that everything that reverts against love is the opposite. That's that evil. So how do we get to that power of love? And that's a challenge for us today. And it looks like Professor wants to jump in with me. Yes, please. One thing about among our... I think I'm in the living room talking to somebody. Oh, we but like I, it. Uh, All right, come up here if you keep you know, going. Um, that what was uh, standing, and I'm peripherally uh, uh, acquainted with the case. Of, uh, I don't know nearly enough, but I know uh, that Rosa Parks uh, was uh, put off the bus in, in Reese Taylor's town, too. That's not the first 13 years before she sat in, in Birmingham. She did it in that town as, as an investigator. The thing I wanted to underscore about our people, I think that it's, it's a good thing. It's not superior to anybody. It's, it's called the ethos of a given group of people, the underlying spirit, the character of a people. You know. uh, we speak the language of the heart. And it's, it's not the pragmatic world of the West and so forth. It's something else, it's, 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 it's deeper than that. And that was expressed in the life of, of Miss Taylor. But she gave those, forgive those people. That happens over and over. The young, normal, white supremacists who murdered nine of our people in Charleston just a year or two ago, whenever it was, <laughs> um, they spoke the language of the heart. If it happens over and over, notice that. That we don't want to get even. We want you to stop it. That's what we want. Now that's, yeah, we don't want vengeance. Anybody read black poets know that. We speak language of the heart. They speak hard, cold, the language of pragmatism and power, and nothing else counts but power. Stokely Carmichael. Stokely Carmichael said it right, and I supported that then, and I support it now. All that white people have that black people need and should want is power. <laughs> it's an unshared power relationship, and it will continue this way until we have power, the ability to act on your own behalf. That's what power is. It doesn't have to be evil. People made it evil. <laughs> we want power to serve humanity not exploit humanity. Couldn't agree with you more. We and the rest of the world have to change that. We have to change that. The white supremacy is an argument with, with nature and God's creatures, with humanity. They're against humanity. Anybody who's different from, from them is in trouble. Not just looks. But life ways, you can have no, way, no ways of thinking other than theirs. You know what I mean? And Einstein was right, and I support him, and black people better get behind this. Imagination is superior to intelligence. That's what we're trapped now is by intelligence, white intelligence. We've got to go beyond that and challenge that. It, man and human beings were put here to be free. I'm convinced of that. So I support all progressive uh, revolutionary movements. I don't care what color the people are. <laughs> you got to get from under this monster, <laughs> which has had the world in the palm of its hand for the last four or five hundred years. Western Europe. That's who's done this. This monster that came out of Western Europe uh, when this guy got lost. You know, I'm talking about Columbus, uh, and that's when it started. <laughs> and thank you, Professor. 
can we give another round of applause to our panelists that were with us and supported us on this journey of learning together. As you can see, it's quite clear that we have work to do. That the question from Reese Taylor, from Rosa Parks, is related to not what someone else will do, but what will you do in the face of injustice? And if Professor Levy Pounds outlined, Minnesota is wonderful with the quality of life, but for some, still separate and unequal. As we look at healthcare policy, as education, every quality of life indicator, the criminal justice system, so you don't have to look too far to figure out what work to do. But I wanna transition us as we prepare for our reception, which you are welcome, you are our guest. I want you to know that St. Thomas is your home. I'm the Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion. It's very important for me to know that this is a place where we should be challenged, this is a place where we should grow, and this is also a place where we should engage. So I have the honor and privilege, I'm actually gonna come up front here so I can make sure we get this right. Can we please have Reese Taylor's family stand? Can you please stand with us? And we're gonna do this right, we're gonna stand up on our feet for a group that came with passion, love, and compassion and challenged all of us to do what everyone talked about on this panel, to get the narrative right, to get it straight, and to know the quest for justice begins and ends with us. So we would like to salute you on the behalf of the University of St. Thomas, on behalf of President Sullivan, our President's Cabinet, Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, and our students. We wanna salute you by presenting the University of St. Thomas Outstanding Commitment Award. It goes to community members that go that extra mile. They go that extra mile to make our mission come alive. As you walked in Purple Town, as I call it, you saw a lot of banners. It looks real nice. But what motivates me as a Tommy is related to our mission. And the possibility that Langston Hughes talked about that we become, we become. We are not where we are, and we cannot stay where we are, but we become that mission. And that mission for us is about morality. It's about social responsibility. It's about social justice, and it's about faith and courage. So that's about Reese Taylor for me. So I would like to present to you the 2018 Outstanding Commitment Community Award to Mrs. Reese Taylor's family. Thank you. Thank you. And we're not done yet. We're not done yet. This is only the beginning. This is only the beginning. I need Ms. Rose McGee to join me briefly. You may have your seat. We have a couple more just brief salutations. Stay with us. You don't want to miss this. So we know Ms. Rose McGee. Oh, we call her the Sweet Potato Pie Initiative. And we know the founder of that, that took it upon herself. Let's talk about this just for one brief moment. She took it upon herself, initiative, what will you do? She said in the face of violence, in the wake of Black Lives Matter, this sister right here said, we're gonna go and bring the pies. Tell them the pie story, please. Well, thank you. Hello, yeah, take it. it smells good, doesn't it? <laughs> well, you know, um, Brother Mahmoud uh, said culture. It's about culture. It's about recognizing it, knowing it, respecting it, and proclaiming it. So for me, the sweet potato pie is the sacred dessert of black culture. Yes. <laughs> Can I get an amen? So with that, um, I grew up in the southern part of the country, Tennessee, rural Tennessee, and I watched two very strong women who raised me, my grandmother and my great-grandmother, make those pies, and they always carried them to places, to people, to relatives in need and of comfort. So one of the things that um, we know, we shall overcome, we hear that song all the time, don't we? Well, the power that gets us through is like the song you were playing and like the song she was singing. I don't know where the lady went doing that beautiful song. Yes, that's the power. That gets us through. And I know that for Miss Taylor, it was the faith and the power and um, the love and, and family. But it was also the food. It was certain foods. And that sweet potato pie, and the reason I consider it to be the sacred dessert of black culture, and I tell people, I didn't call it. It called me. I was minding my own business. And I was sitting there watching Ferguson happening, just like everybody else on television, and saw the faces of hopelessness of people, young black faces, and I'm like, what can I do? And it's 
far as I'm concerned, the Lord said, go in the kitchen and make a bunch of pies. So that's what I did. I went in and I made about 30, loaded them up, and my son was silly enough to go with me down to Ferguson. And along the way, and I never just said, here, take the pie. I asked, would you like to have a pie? And they couldn't believe that I was offering them a sweet potato pie. Because you know, everybody feels, can't nobody make sweet potato pie like my mama. So the story with the pies was going one way. And it was wonderful seeing you here today, Miss CJ, because you remember I went down to Alabama and I spent some time interviewing your mother because that was the, the direction the story was going, was getting these interviews and what people thought about the pie. But it's taken on a different life. So now people are coming together as volunteers and they make the pies and then we take them into communities. We took them to Mother Emanuel Church after the shooting there. We took them to Standing Rock, made by indigenous women. And we took them right over there to North Minneapolis when Jamar Clark was killed, to protesters as well as to community leaders and police officers. We took them over to St. Paul to acknowledge Philando Castile. We took them over when the bombing at the mosque took place in Bloomington. And after the explosion that happened at one of our schools in town, Minnehaha Academy, that killed two people. And then when Justine Damon was killed, pies were taken. So people come, they tell their stories about where they'd like to take the pies. I can't carry them all. <laughs> so people take them all. And we, in my community of Golden Valley, Minnesota, which is one of those places that like to say, we ain't got no problems here. Yes, you do. So we bring them together the weekend of Martin Luther King. And on Saturday, people come make the pies. On Sundays, people around, they talk, have the tough conversations about race. And now I guess I'm going to have to say around white supremacy. And then we make the number of pies that Dr. King's age would be. So this year we made how many pies? 89. And next year we'll be making what? So I encourage you to join us as we make those 90 pies. So today, um, Dr. Tyner said, bring a pie for the family, but I brought two just in case. And there they are, sweet potato comfort pie. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And not another reason why we're here today in connecting this to the work of Ujama Place, what you heard today are stories about roots, about history. And we also have a goal to bring the Ujama men with us in summer 2018 to Ghana to learn more about their history, to go to the slave castles and forts and see the root of white supremacy as well. But we need you to help us on that journey. But this journey and none of this would not have been possible without a special lady that even celebrated her birthday with us yesterday, she was even working. Ms. Monique Linder, will you please join us on the stage? And my assistant, Monica Habia, would like to bestow upon you a special gift from Ghana. And we're talking about the Sweet Potato Pie Initiative. This is also about the culture of family and community, making food, making food as well. So we just wanna thank Ms. Monique because she brought us all together and without her, we wouldn't be here today. So that doesn't officially conclude our program because she's our organizer. So I'll let her conclude and welcome you and invite you just across the way to the reception. Thank you. Thank you so much everyone for coming. We have a reflection and reception. I know we're running behind, but if you can join us because sweet potato pies was Reese Taylor's favorite dessert as well as pound cake. So we have both in the library, right across the, the hall. And the family will be there if you wanna talk to them and take pictures. And I really appreciate everybody for coming out and sharing this moment honoring Reese Taylor. Thank you. Thank you.